Okay. Um, all right. First of all, uh, uh, I'd like to, to thank Luca and Karthik for uh, organizing um, this, this very interesting symposium and for uh, inviting me. Uh, I would like to tell you how perhaps um, some thoughts about how we can perhaps combine artificial intelligence and scientific computing for flow modeling and control. Um, I know that many of you are uh, doing similar things. I, I thought I will call uh, this uh, fusion between the two things as Alois, uh, Alois implying that the, the fusion of two different things are going to be something better than, than these two things. And I will try to explain why do I think uh, that AI and scientific computing maybe are not necessarily uh, so parallel as we may think, but their fusion is, is certainly exciting. Um, before I go on, I'd like to appreciate and, and thank the people who have done all this work. Um, uh, many of them have uh, been actually Guido is down in London in DeepMind. Um, they have different positions and I'd like to acknowledge also uh, my collaborators, uh, Jane Bai, Matej Praprotnik, Femi Sapsis, Caroline Uller and Julia Javadlov, uh, who are from, were not from my group, but we interacted in different capacities. Um, so why do we do what we do? Uh, we all know that we care about complex multi-scale systems. Um, we know that there's many, many different scales. We are not the first to think about trying to come up with ways of uh, combining different scales and coming up with surrogates, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but um, what we have been doing so far is we have been basically trying to solve some of these problems using the forward way of doing large scale simulations. Um, and we have been developing for a long time something that today is called the digital uh, twin. So here's a digital twin for about eight years ago. What we were trying to do, this is a microfluidic device. The microfluidic device has posts and then through these posts and uh, posts, it can separate large um, um, structures from smaller structures. So for example, the red are red blood cells, um, the white and uh, cells are the blue and or the green obstacles or, uh, objects and, and these things get separated by a fluid mechanics phenomenon called deterministic lateral um, displacement. So um, what, what happens is that uh, people are building these chips but they were not having a lot of direction. So you see a white cell there that is being separated from the red blood cells. The idea is can you separate circulating two more cells from, from blood. So what we have been doing is we take actually um, a one-to-one um, device. It's a millimeter uh, long device. We were doing sub-micron resolution uh, simulations using dissipative particle dynamics. This is a simulation um, that uh, eventually used about one trillion uh, particles. It was a finalist for the Gordon Bell in 2015. And, and there's a lot of issues about the simulations that I would like to, uh, will not um, go into depth today, but I, it's just to show you that indeed we, we have always been trying to do um, uh, digital twins and actually uh, given that this is a very expensive simulation the video here has been done with 1.6 billion of particles it was very difficult to do a lot of iteration so you had to come up with clever ways of uh, helping the people uh, design these posts. Other things we have been doing is we have been developing numerical methods um, to do uh, flows with bubbles uh, there is a lot of um, uh, numerical methods that are coming here and a lot of computer science expertise to try to simulate flows using tens of thousands of, of bubbles. Uh, uh, so uh, having people who are capable of doing such simulations is, is quite a privilege. This is by Petr Karnakov and Petr also has been doing simulations in microfluidic devices developing something that people are calling microfluidic um, uh, crystals. Um, now, uh, another thing we have been doing with this capability is to help people uh, develop membraneless electrolyzers. Uh, usually when you have an electrolyzer and you try to separate the hydrogen and the oxygen, you put a membrane in between. This can be expensive. This can introduce uh, a weight to the device. There's also ideas of using fluid mechanics simply by shaping the electrodes to separate the hydrogen and the oxygen. We were interacting with people in Lausanne. Uh, the original design was for manufacturing purposes, basically cubes. Um, and then uh, because of these cubes, um, we were getting all sorts of bubbles. Again, these are really uh, expensive and interesting simulations for me because they include electrochemistry, Navier-Stokes, multi-phase flows, and, and so on. And, and then what we did is we performed an optimization on this device, and I will show you in a second how we went about doing that. Um, and then we came up with a slanted design that eventually actually the people 
went in the lab, uh, they did experiments and they found indeed that it behaves much better um, than the original um, device. So there is merit in, in um, developing uh, codes that are interesting and they contain complex physics. And, and again, uh, then, then we can combine them with artificial intelligence to do optimization. So before we go into the world of neural nets, I, I'd like to tell you another world um, that perhaps some of us uh, may have uh, ventured into, and that's the world of optimization. So the idea is that if you want to perform uh, an optimization, um, there is an approach where you consider uh, the problem that you wish to optimize as a black box. And then what you try to do is you try not to understand what's going on inside this black box, but you try to achieve a result. And as far as I understand, uh, when artificial intelligence was originally developed, uh, it was a means to a goal. It was not about understanding. And usually when we do scientific computing, and, and that's the culture we have had, we care about understanding. And after understanding, we do design. There's the other approach. Let's not understand, but let's design first and optimize first, and then maybe understand. And the idea here uh, was that uh, what we were doing about 20 years ago, um, the idea is I try to find a probability distribution uh, that contains the optimal points. How do I construct uh, this probability distribution by um, doing uh, trial and error? And then, so here is the model of the probability distribution I'm looking after. So this is how you cast stochastic optimization into, into this framework. And at the same time, because some of the problems we had were very expensive, uh, we were using meta models to replace expensive evaluation in the selection process. So these are what maybe today or people before used to call reduced order models. Uh, we were using Gaussian processes and so on. But, but the whole loop is, is quite interesting. Um, here's how these methods work. Um, Nico Hansen is one of the people who did most of this work. You have a multi, you have a function that has many minima. Um, you are postulating that you are sampling from a Gaussian probability distribution. You don't know the mean and the covariance. Um, uh, and then what you do is you start and you evaluate in certain samples. You do the sampling and then um, you sort and weigh according to the fitness of the samples. You recombine and then now what you do is you try to create through this mean values a covariance matrix. And then you're, what you're doing is you're updating your covariance uh, matrix. Keep in mind this mean and the covariance because we're going to return to that type of, of, of thinking. So here, this is about optimization. The key thing is the points that you're selecting in order to build the mean and the covariance are, are points that are improving your solution. Um, so this is the covariance matrix adaptation technique is able to find um, this, this minima. We have been using it for a long, long time. And again, trying to um, understand, uh, trying not to understand, but try to find actually understand the optimal situation. Uh, we were very much interested to find out about optimization for uh, survival. This is a, a zebra fish and it's trying to eat actually a baby zebra fish. And you see that the baby zebra fish is escaping. So the question is uh, when these baby fish are escaping, is, is this escape pattern optimal? You can analyze the vorticity, you can see all sorts of things. Um, uh, this is what experimentalists did. What we did is we put it as a reverse engineering problem. We actually found out that for small fish, where the Reynolds number is small, you actually do get um, uh, this uh, particular pattern. But the interesting thing was to use Lagrangian coherent structures and to put into the flow certain particles and to try and understand what's really happening. So what's really happening, there's a ball of fluid that is being ejected. And if you follow the green and the blue particles, you find out that what this guy does is it traps fluid and then uh, it releases it through a vortex. And that's actually like you're on a boat, you throw a stone behind and then you propel yourself uh, very fast. Um, I'm not aware of how I would have gone in a forward way uh, to find out what is the mechanism for this optimal uh, transport. So I'd like to argue that sometimes by doing the reverse problem, um, you may find uh, interesting, um, interesting solutions, and then you can try to, to understand. Um, now this is, so we have applied it to all sorts of problems, and actually other colleagues, um, when, I, when I went to Harvard, I had my colleague Katya Bertoldi, he says, uh, I'm doing optimization. I said, how do you do optimization? He says, I found this great method, it's called CMA, and we're using it in the lab. <laughs> and then that's actually, I told her, oh, I know about this method. And, Actually, people at Caltech uh, have been using CMA quite a lot in, in, in experiments. So that's actually, I'm, I'm very happy 
to see it not only in simulations, but combined with, with experiments. Now, um, so uh, this is what I did after I stopped doing what I'm going to uh, tell you now. So this is something um, I started working on, on machine learning uh, back in, uh, in uh, when I was a postdoc at Stanford in, in 1994. I attended a course in computational psychology by David Rumelhart. David Rumelhart is the person, along with Hinton, that developed the back propagation. Uh, he was teaching a course on, uh, at Stanford, uh, and I was very, very happy to went there and attend it. So here is actually inspired from his lectures. So we were talking about data. And then um, at that time in fluid mechanics community, the important uh, thing was the POD. Everybody was doing POD into fluid mechanics data. So now something that came to my attention then is, okay, if you have a, a POD, this is what you do. You create a covariance matrix, and then you have this linear problem. And, and now it's the time of Karthik return the favor from yesterday <laughs> because I would like to argue in favor of non-linearity and I would like to explain why which doesn't mean that I don't appreciate linearity. So you have a linear problem and now you can do you can keep your eigenvectors but now this is fine. What if the this uh, description that you have is not enough? What if you want to do this thing in a non-linear fashion? And and uh, I'm not sure how you can go and do this kind of things now in non-linear fashion. In a, in a straightforward way, but um, you can actually uh, do it uh, in a different way. The same thing, you can do neural nets. And the idea is that actually here we don't do neural nets, we just do a linear uh, transform where I take a vector uh, matrix W, I project my data into a latent space, then I take the transpose matrix, I get an X tilde, and, and that's actually uh, an autoencoder, that's a linear autoencoder, and, and actually thanks to this paper by my friend Gil Baldi back in 1989, he showed that when you do this minimization, you don't get stuck in local minima. Uh, when you have these linear transformations, you have a lot of subtle points and you can escape them because you are in high dimensions. So these two things are um, producing you the same uh, thing. So now the beauty of, of this, the beauty of this, this is an architecture. I call this an architecture. I call this a mathematical formula. Uh, now, the nice thing about this architecture, it's flexible. It's modular and it can actually accommodate um, uh, non-linearities because the same way that you have here uh, linear ways, you can actually assume uh, non-linear functions. And these are basically the non-linear autoencoders. So you can have the same code and then by changing uh, the way you transfer information between the different spaces, you have automatically uh, a non-linearity. Uh, um, I applied this thing to um, uh, reconstruction of turbulent flow. So these are some pieces of a, in a channel flow. I, I think there was a velocity field or a vorticity field colored by some kind of wall normal uh, velocity. This was the original field. This is the reconstruction you would get with a certain number of modes. Um, through the POD, and this is by using the same number of weights by using uh, neural nets. And uh, I'd like to do some shameless advertising. Um, initially, uh, when we were trying to improve these neural nets, we used two layers, and with two layers, we could not go very far. So we started adding layers, and I think some of the, if not the first big neural network for fluid mechanics was done there in this work by accident. Um, there was one more thing which was uh, useful here, and I think it relates to some of the other things that uh, I think Beverly and Karthik and others talked about yesterday. And the other thing we did back then is we wanted to reconstruct the flow above the wall by using information only on the wall. And, and what I can tell you is by using only shear and pressure on the wall, this was the information we had on the wall, our neural net was not able to do it. We were not able to, to, to construct it. But then, uh, if you know this, if you do a Taylor series expansion, you know the shear at the wall, and you know this, the derivative of the vorticity is actually nothing but the derivative in the other direction of the pressure. If you help the neuron, if you help the system with things that you know, a linear and a second order term, and then you give to the neural net the rest of the stuff, uh, then you were able actually to get some really good reconstruction on the mean of the flow uh, above the wall. So this argue about um, not discarding all the fluid mechanics that we know <laughs> and, and hope that neural nets will solve everything, but to try to combine uh, the two. So um, this 
perhaps Yuan could think of combining, for example, resolving plus neural nets or RL or whatever else uh, you want, or uh, your linear models with, with neural nets. I think it's not a reality. Now, um, I, we stopped doing all these kind of things because uh, I want to show you why. Um, so I started working on these things at, um, and I could not, I was, it took me three years to publish this paper I showed you. I could not publish any of this stuff. I was a postdoc looking for, for a job. And actually, it was very nice that CTR uh, accommodated this, um, this um, review, which is applications of machine learning uh, algorithm to flow modeling on optimization. I have a similar paper that appeared about 20 years uh, later. Um, this actually had some really interesting works also with Bill Reynolds. Bill Reynolds was very supportive and he used some of the CMA in the lab to do these blooming things. You can find all this information in there. Now, the different, what the reason I'm putting this up is this is, this is where computers were at that time when we were doing this work. And it's where computers were are, are close to today. And the difference is what it would take about one year in a supercomputer to train. Uh, maybe today takes less uh, than two or three minutes. And that makes you think um, differently. Um, so now, um, some thoughts from these 20 years. Uh, my understanding is that when we have been trained in scientific computing, um, we have always been worried about the quest for exactness, DNS, second order accuracy, and so on. But then when you study um, AI, machine learning, this is about statistical inference. It's about expectations. It's not necessarily about exactness. Another thing is that uh, very often the culture in scientific computing has been understanding, 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 and then extrapolation. And then what you have in AI is not necessarily understanding, but you want to minimize the drug. You don't care why the drug gets minimized. And the other thing which I think is, um, is different, in the case of scientific computing, we do a lot of numerical methods. Um, we do a lot of mathematics. Um, uh, now AI does a lot of um, uh, learning architectures, uh, which is a very interesting way, a modular way uh, to think. And I will show you some examples of that. Uh, I would like to argue that it should not be an or, but it should be an end in all these different things, but appreciating that these two different, these things are different. They're not necessarily compatible. Uh, and I, I will show you some difficulties uh, with that. So I will show you what I call alloys. Um, so I will show you um, three things. One is called learning the effective dynamics for multi-scale modeling. Um, the second one um, is called ODIL, optimizing the discrete loss. And I would like to show you how actually by doing things that we know how to do for many, many decades, we can outperform the famous pins by orders of magnitude. And I would like to uh, conclude uh, with uh, scientific multi-agent reinforcement learning for doing uh, closures. Uh, please do interrupt me, challenge me, uh, complain, <laughs> or. Or, or disagree with me at any time. I would really uh, love to have that. I have given this talk many times. I would be really happy if there is some pushback or objections or anything uh, uh, from you. I just want to say that I don't disagree with the experiment What? Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah because I. No, I, I didn't mean to, to say that you disagree, but. Yeah. Because I, I introduced it adaptively by implying that it becomes non Okay. Unless you find a really clever um, space where things are linear, if you pick the right quantities of interest. No, it's a, but even then, I, I think in my experience in fluid mechanics is that without some correction for nonlinearity, yeah, I, I, at least the problems I have tried, I have failed. Uh, I just want to say that. Um, so what is the what is this led? I, I think I, I don't need to say much because I think um, uh, Luca did this stuff already. So he told you how we can use data and neural nets to to, to predict. Um, so my um, test bed has been actually the Kuramoto Shivasinski. Uh, there is a parameter in the Kuramoto Shivasinski, um, and and this is a parameter that determines the chaoticity of of the system. Um, so what I'm instead of using. Um, an experiment, I'm using data from a numerical simulation of Kuramoto Shivasinski, and I would like to show you how using data from uh, simulations that they have increased uh, complexity actually challenges uh, machine learning methods. So initially, uh, we uh, were thinking of using high dimensional data. I do a simulation and then I take chunks of this data 
in high dimensions. We very soon found that at least for the LSTMs we were using, this was not a good thing. So we went back and we did this um, uh, encoders. This time we started with PCA. Uh, we observed uh, certain modes, and now we are training on reduced order data. Okay. Um, now, um, so how does this work? So what you do is you have um, uh, a simulation, which is the truth. You do a, a coarse training of the simulation to SVD. You collect some data here, and then you feed this data into something called long short-term memory uh, networks. It could be we have tried also echo state networks, reservoir nets, all sorts of things. Um, and then that's how this thing is, is propagating. It keeps predicting and, and, and doing all sorts of things like that. So how good is this? So how good is this? Well, um, you can, after you have trained it, it seems to be capturing uh, the, the, the flow. Actually, surprisingly, it goes up to time one, up to time two, uh, up to time three, and, and up to time four, and up to time five, you still it starts to fail. And now there's two ways to look at this, either with a uh, glass is half full, in which you say, look, up to a certain time, uh, you have been able to predict, or with a glass half empty, where you say, well, this thing is hopeless, because eventually it's going to depart uh, from what uh, the real system uh, dynamics are, are doing. And, and in fact, actually, when you look at training, uh, as you increase the chaoticity of the system, uh, what a lot of people are doing, uh, uh, I'm sorry to be critical, very often people will demonstrate uh, solutions in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Kuramoto Shivasinski but with L tilde of 8. Uh, and L tilde of 8, you can keep the solution for quite some time because it's not such a chaotic system. But if you go to L tilde of 10, uh, at least our stuff fails completely. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually very, very uh, problematic. So I was actually very interesting. Um, there was this article in Quantum Magazine that says machine learning has an amazing ability to predict chaos. And then one of my students came and says, look, this article, I say, yeah, but come on, you know it's wrong, but it says, they quote us that we say we predict chaos. And it said that we just published that we don't. So, so there are people who take these Lorentz systems, and then there is Lorentz 32, 36, 64, 96, and so on. And some of them are quite peaceful. Uh, you can call them chaotic, uh, but again, uh, you, you, you cannot. Uh, you cannot really predict chaos, and, and it does not, and maybe, uh, Let's leave some room for, for hope. Now, are we dead? Uh, now, as I said, the glass is half full and half empty. So what if we use the half full glass, okay? So can you combine ROMs and, and, um, and, and large scale simulations? Yeah. This idea, I'd like to credit uh, Yanis Kevrakidis for that with the equation free method. And there's of course other people like Kumano Wadi, uh, um, also he came with the flavor idea and, and Wainani came with HMM. Uh, there are similar ideas. I'd like to keep this equation-free framework. That's the first time I saw that from Yanis. What's the idea? The idea is that you have a micro-scale model, let's say your full-blown simulation. And what Yanis proposes is you have some interpolation uh, where you go into this um, average field and then you use these points here and you do some kind of a projection. And then after you start failing, you go back out into um, the full uh, system. There are lots of Great papers um, by Yanis. I found this problem lacking in two ways or having problems in two ways. I, I have been trying and thinking, how can I use this method for 20 years? And it just occurred to me a couple of years ago, how can perhaps extend it? Uh, there's one thing, which is I think the big thing is how do you go from less to more? Uh, what, is this, what is this operator mu uh, versus the operator capital M? Uh, and I think in some of the papers of Yanis, you could not find a direct correspondence between the two. And the other thing is that um, this projection, where you take two points and you do Euler or Ungekuta, I was not very uh, satisfying. So it was actually in front of my eyes how perhaps you could have done that because we were doing autoencoders since a long, long time. So the idea uh, that we proposed is to learn the effective dynamics by using some machine learning tools. So there's two machine learning tools we deploy. One is that, as I just showed you, if you take a micro scale simulation, that's what you did with the Kuramoto Shivasinski. Here I'm having an encoder. I could have had the PCA. I go to RNNs and then um, I and now here I'm doing RNNs to integrate. Uh, I'm using memory because I think memory incorporates some of the delays that you lose when you do this course training. Um, and, and then whenever I find that I need to go out or I start to fail and you can ask me when is this happening, I can tell you. Uh, then uh, we're having a decoder that brings us back to the microdynamics and we go back and forth. 
so this was published uh, about a year ago. Uh, how good is it? Um, I hope the idea is quite clear. Uh, we have a compression mechanism. Uh, we have an advancement in the compressed space, and then we have a decompression mechanism, and then we uh, interplay between the two. So, of course, the big thing is how much time do you spend in one uh, versus uh, the other? <laughs> Otherwise, it's not really uh, worth it, the extra cost. So let's go to Kuramoto Sivasinski. Um, an interesting thing uh, is that people uh, talked about PCA and autoencoders. I think, Luca, you mentioned that. Uh, what we found, actually, it was interesting when we did the mid-square error of the reconstruction, we found that the autoencoders uh, were saturating after a dimension of about eight. And then there is a theoretical paper that says that the effective dynamics uh, of the Kuramoto Sivasinski lie indeed on an eight-dimensional manifold. So the way you compress is important, so the PCA is not able to capture the number eight, but these autoencoders were able uh, to, to find that, and we use two different ones. Uh, and now, um, here, here's the result now, how, how with, this, with this process. And actually, what I'm showing you is I'm showing you results where uh, we never went back out. We stayed only in the latent phase. So here is the LED, the latent phase, <laughs> and here is what you get uh, if you want to compare uh, with a full uh, with a full decomposition. In principle, when we do this, we do it only at the end, uh, only at one slice. But here we have been doing this continuously in order to compare. And now if you see here, you don't see that these two things are not giving you exactly the same thing. But on the other hand, uh, this is where I argue that it's not exactness you should be seeking, but some kind of statistical metrics. If you look at the phase space, um, you see the phase space that is covered by the LED is given uh, by this uh, descriptor over there. And then the reference is, is this one. So it's relatively good. But at the same time, um, the, the speed up uh, when you do that is about two orders of magnitude. At the same time, what I'm not very happy is the normalized root mean square error. As I said, this ratio is the critical error. This is, this is where you stay completely on, on the latent space. But you see the error is not really uh, going down uh, very much. So, so it's, uh, again, uh, a result that um, yeah, you can you can decide how, how good it is. Now, uh, we went to Reynolds number of uh, 100, the flow past the cylinder. Everybody's doing this Reynolds number. We had to do it as well. And, and, and then we compressed the data down to two points in the latent space of two. Um, and, and so we actually got some really interesting results. We got results where now actually the root mean square error was actually uh, dropping as you uh, uh, reduce this, this ratio. And the interesting thing is that we are actually were even to capture the drug coefficient within about 4% by staying only in the latent phase dynamics. So, so it seems that with just two degrees of freedom, you can do the Reynolds number of, of 100. And now, usually, a machine learning talks usually shows if we have done that, we can do turbulence. My question is, what about Reynolds number of 1,000? So we ask this question to ourselves, and this is the results that we get, and the results are not so good. So we're not able to really, in my case, uh, get really the error to go down very much. We get the drug coefficient, which is about 15-20%, which is not very satisfying. Uh, the root mean square error doesn't go down very much. Um, this is the reference, and this is the prediction. Visually, they look okay. But the interesting thing was to look at the error. Now, the interesting thing was to look at the error, and then what we found, actually, is that we make the largest error uh, near the vicinity of the cylinder. And this absolutely makes sense because this is where a vorticity gets produced. So my argument is you cannot just take a machine learning person and tell him to or her to solve this problem, but you have to inform them about the fluid mechanics. And, and here, what we need to do and what we are doing now, and we're getting better results, is uh, we are having autoencoders that are giving more emphasis onto this data next to the cylinder. And indeed, uh, we get um, better uh, results. Um, and uh, there is all sorts of papers that we are building around this framework. Uh, we have done it also in molecular um, simulations. Uh, we are trying to do, if we can do folding of proteins with this type of things. Um, uh, the results are uh, interesting, uh, just to put it uh, mildly. And, and there is another um, more recent work. Uh, I, as I said, I, it's not in preparation. It's under revision. No, you don't see that up there. Um, so, so the idea is that when we do this lead, uh, there was one question that you didn't ask me, and the question you didn't ask me is how do you decide to go from the micro, from the macro scale back out into uh, the micro scale? 
So now, uh, the way we do it now is by having ensembles of recurrent uh, neural networks operating in the latent phase. And we are actually uh, creating um, these ensembles of neural networks. They're, they're predicting the mean uh, uh, distribution of the system. But at the same time, they're also making an estimate about the variance of the things uh, that we are predicting. And when the variance increases, then after a certain threshold, that's when we decide that it's time to go out into uh, the micro description. So it is an adaptive way. Uh, it relies on the fact that these uh, RNNs in the latent space are cheap, so we can have several of them. Um, uh, so this is what What's we call... What's the difference between the, the various members of the ensemble? Um, they have just a different initialization okay. in their latent space. Yeah, yeah. The architecture. the architecture is the same. You can't play with that. <laughs> You can you can you can say some of them are uh, it's uh, again what I like about architectures is that they're modular. Uh, you can, of course, you become empirical and you do heuristics and and you say let's try this, let's try that. And it's it would, it's it's uh, I'm trying to engage theor theoreticians to tell us um, you yeah, should be doing the that. Yeah, challenge whatever you go to ensembles and, and innovation methods like this that it's not clear what is the interaction between mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It is a measure of probability. Yeah. So, so what we do here uh, is actually we have two neural networks. The recurrent neural nets are tracking two things. One of them is the mean of the distribution. Uh -huh. but, so it's a basically kind of a Gaussian process that we're learning. One of the neural nets is learning the mean, and and the other uh, neural network is learning the covariance of the distribution. So you can have several pairs of this, and then you start to play, and you try to see when do they start to disagree with itself. The key idea is disagreement. There is other ways of, of doing um, inference in, in the latent space. Uh, you can think that perhaps you have some data, and then you can do some Bayesian inference. Mm -hmm. There is something else called conformal inference, which is very interesting from your colleague, Candice. Uh, uh, and so there's lots of interesting ideas, but um, this is our first uh, try, if you like. So, so now uh, we, uh, yeah, please. What, the ways of the different uh, recurrent neural networks are the same. It's just when they start to display each other, it's slightly different. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Um, so, so now um, here is an example of of a trivial system, or here is the Van der Poel oscillator. You have a parameter mu here. You can play with this parameter. And now uh, you can see other led uh, at work. So, so you see the micro is evolving, and then the macro fades. Uh, they diverge, so we don't use it. So you will see that you stay blue, blue, blue on the different um, uh, cycles. Uh, and I'm sorry, it's such a video is just to show you the pain. Now we start to do things faster and faster, but then you start to see that the red things, which are the ensembles of the RNNs, they start slowly uh, to agree. And then uh, you start to see that we have a measure of our error and a measure of our uncertainty. Um, so eventually, this thing is is actually able to um, to propagate for quite some time, as you see. You're using micro macro only to capture almost the full uh, part of this um, of this cycle. So this is the idea of Adelaide. Um There is a similar thing. Yes. You also are very concerned about the transients or parameter changes. If I have parameter of, of the what? No, like, let's first consider the transient part. Right? Mm -hmm. The transients have to be accounted for. How would they have to? I don't know. I don't know. I would probably lose it. I would, I would lose it the way they are. No. It's, a, it's a very important point. The, another thing we did, uh, just to show you maybe if these transients are interesting, it's plain at the moment. We have a, a cylinder in a Reynolds number. And now, actually, to your transit, now we're going to change all of a sudden the Reynolds number. Yeah, that was the second part of my question. Yeah, so, so now uh, you will see that, okay, it, we have gone down and, and, and we have captured it. And now we're going to uh, give a kick to the system. And actually, just to, to let you know that we, we can do higher Reynolds numbers now with these yeah. autoencoders. Uh, but now you will see at some point we're going to kick the system to a higher Reynolds number, and the thing is going to fail and mm -hmm. lose it. So now it has learned. It's doing relatively uh, well uh, over there. Um, MSE keeps uh, going down. And now, come on, where is the kick? Uh, 
Uh, I hope I have the right video. Um, somehow my, yeah, my it's, going ahead. it's going ahead, but where is it? The, the Reynolds number should go up at some point. The reason why I asked about the it will go. Uh, yeah, there. Now the Reynolds number gives to five, and then you see you fail again. But now you have trained. Huh? You have some information from the lower end number. So, so what happens? I see in my screen it's showing. In my screen, I I have moved up to oh here, yeah there. You see, my error goes up, but it has learned something from the lower end number, so it's actually going to go down again. So we can we play with this thing. It's a it's a new. Uh, framework that, that uh, we are exploring and, and again uh, same also if you have this Adaled is a framework if you have you can you can replace my RNNs with a linear model or with anything you like it's the principle of of alternating that is the interesting thing it's it's you will see it's um, going down the, the other thing that that the green it's actually the fraction of macro steps you see how much of it, and the micro steps are having a factor of about a thousand compared to the, to the micro steps. In the, in the but you see how this thing is 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 behaving. I asked a question because if you're interested in in going to be a factor, just the Hankel DMD that you're talking about. Hankel DMD just triangulates the linear okay. uh, expansion to actually get to where you want. Maybe use that on top of what you are Happy to yeah. Happy to uh, yeah. So and 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 here so here so here is just for out of provocation. This is this is amount of money. This is a bet, <laughs> and this is uh, at the same time this is a bet of amount of these uh, thousands of dollars that machine learning will not be able to do these simulations. And this is an impulsive started floor on the cylinder uh, at these Reynolds numbers. It's 2D, uh, but you can see at this 100,000 Reynolds number, this has done, been done with wavelet adapted grids. Um, uh, and I will show you this, this layer here, I have about 1,000 uh, points that are crossed here. It's, it's been using billions of computational elements. It appeared in JFM. Uh, and my claim is I cannot see how much learning will ever cut something like that. And, and if anybody wants to take the bet, <laughs> it has to be now, <laughs> not later. <laughs> And, and just to show you uh, what I find, actually, just to be a little bit critical, this is people who know how to write this code and to learn these numerical methods uh, and all that, they become discussed. It's very difficult to find a person who knows good numerics and uh, yeah, all these stabilities, etc., and to write code like that. You can find a lot of people who do machine learning, but I'm very concerned that this art cannot be lost. And that's enough. And I don't know <laughs> what to say about that. Um, so, so now a, a second thing, um, I, I'm going to talk about learning uh, without neural networks. Uh, there was some criticism about neural networks. I, yesterday by Karthik, I share uh, your opinion uh, that uh, neural networks are problematic in, in many ways. So, so now uh, there has been this work uh, that was revitalized very recently. Uh, I was neural net for solving uh, PDs. So what's the idea? The idea is that you have an equation and boundary conditions. Uh, you're collecting points x in space and time. Let's say this is a 1D. You collect these collocation points. You interpolate with the neural network, and, and you get the solution, which is a nonlinear solution to the neural net. And then how do you train the neural net? Well, you train the neural net by doing the minimization of the equation. And the nice thing here is that you can add penalty terms for your boundary uh, conditions. OK. Um, now, um, I have another slide that I have skipped it, uh, but maybe uh, I don't know if I should skip it. I should not maybe skip it, but um, the slide is here. It's from another talk, and I need to show you this. So this is an old method. This is a method that was developed back in 1998 from an obscure professor from uh, Northwest Greece, Ioannina, I happen to actually know this person and I actually tried these pins at that time. Today they are called pins and actually it didn't work. Uh, and now what the new pins are, are saying, it's actually similar ideas uh, have been used. Uh, if you go and look at this paper, you will find that there is no similar idea. It's the same idea. 
the, the new thing is that we have modern computational tools to execute this idea, and that makes a difference. Because as I showed you, back when we were doing these ideas in 1999, it would take us a year to train anything. Now it takes minutes. So that is, in my opinion, what makes uh, the difference. Now the question is, is this, uh, is this better? Um, so, so what I like actually about this idea is not necessarily the original thing, but I think this is something that actually came from George. And, and the idea, I think, is that um, what if I have data the same way that I do boundary conditions, I can actually put as a penalty term the data, or I can put some kind of another functional as a penalty term. Of course, there are questions about uh, how well posed is the problem, um, and so on. Do you get minima? Is it everything correct? I totally share the things, but nevertheless, it's a way of thinking how do you get experimental data to be combined uh, with uh, in this in this framework, and and uh, and the question that I have to you is: Have you seen this before? You say you have this in these people doing things like that. Okay. Nevertheless, that's pins. That's what uh, people are doing now, and so I would like to argue that there is a better way to do this, and and it's something that also is an old way. Now you take the equation and, and then what you usually do in forward solvers, you take the equation and you discretize it. And then you have to solve a, a forward problem. And in the case that you have a linear operation, you have a matrix, um, uh, a linear system that you have to solve. So now uh, what, you go, what if you go crazy and you do what pins do? Instead of uh, solving for the forward problem, you write the problem as a minimization of that and then uh, you are um, um, whatever uh, constraints uh, that you have. And again, um, have you seen this thing before? Yes? Yes or no? So people, I, I try to publish this paper, and people tell me, oh, look at this book, it's in there. I look at this book, it's not in there. But I think people have done this. Uh, but Obviously, when you do this, you pay an arm and a leg because you're much more expensive than the forward problem. But now you're doing the same thing that pins do, except that you have an additional thing that you can do data. And, and you have one more thing over pins that you are consistent. You have done a consistent digitization. When you do pins, you have a global interpolator that interpolates all to all. You have a convection problem and all of a sudden, you're solving it with a, a discretization that would correspond to an elliptic problem. So it's no, no wonder that this thing can, can be suffering uh, from that. So instead of doing the, uh, this, what if you do this? And by the way, it will take you um, two lines of code if you have any forward solver to apply this, this method. So now, um, the, the, so how do we compare the two? So here's the comparison of the two. If you do this optimizing of a discrete loss, you're solving on the discrete field, and then you are adding whatever boundary conditions and whatever data points you have, and you do this minimization. Uh, an additional thing, which I will keep hammering, is that here now you can use Newton's methods. Uh, you can formulate patients because we have actually locality. You cannot do second order methods uh, with, with neural networks. I mean, there are some work on that, but usually people do first order methods. Now, how good they work? Well, how good they work is like that. Um, Pins with 700 parameters, um, you solve for this wave equation and you get it. If you do the Odile, um, you get it also. And if you do the reference, which is the forward problem, you get the same answer. Now, the difference is that for the uh, pins, depending on your initialization, you get different types of errors. But on the mean, you get a good error. The difference is the execution time. And that is that pins about five orders of magnitude, five orders of magnitude, 100,000 times more expensive than Odile. And, and, and that's that's my case. <laughs> that uh, why people do pins is a mystery to me. Uh, there is an argument that pins are better in high dimensional uh, spaces. I would like to see that. Actually, that could be a place where they can be winning because these grids are failing after a while in high dimensions. But just to, to show you that this deal, we can do, um, if you give me the initial and the final point here and you tell me solve this equation, I can infer this operator here, k of u, um, that it is inferred here with Odile. Uh, I can do other things. I infer the conductivity in the heat equation by uh, getting uh, some, some data 
if you give me some data in a domain, um, then if you tell me also what is the equation I'm solving, I can, I can infer, and you have some unknowns, I can infer um, this, this type of unknowns. And something that perhaps may be appealing uh, to experimentalists is um, if you are giving me uh, some points in the domain, and you tell me there is a flow around an obstacle, but you don't know what is the obstacle, I can formulate it very easily by using a penalization method and having as an unknown the shape of the obstacle. And, and so uh, we get flow past the sphere, and then if you give me that many data, I will guess that this is the body. If you give me more data, I start to converge to a sphere. If you give me a half sphere, here my algorithm actually thought that it's some kind of an ellipsoid, but as I get more points, I get start to get a, a half sphere. Yes. Yes. And if you take that, I will put the triangle. Maybe also learning rotation is good. Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a, I can tell you that I, I am fighting with reviewers for two years, uh, but they tell me two things. One is I don't use the pins correctly. Uh, and I have, I have taken the code from the from that they have, and I have we have written code that outperforms their code by a factor of ten. Um, I have implemented every metaparameter that reviewers tell me to implement, and they still tell me I'm doing something wrong with the pins. I ask them, please run the case yourself. It's really frustrating. It's like you are hitting a wall, but I want to hit this wall because I think it's important. It's, it's five, six orders of magnitude better. I mean, it's a, it's a different method. So um, we have a multi-resolution version of that also, which is, I think, exciting. Um, this is actually, it's really weird. We, it depends where you send it also, <laughs> but anyway. So, so this is coming out where you have a multi, you can have multiple grids, by the way, which is kind of hinting in the direction that, that, that you're painting um, Karthik and, and, and uh, I would, so, so here is comparison of the 2D uh, steady state uh, navier stokes equations. Uh, it shows you the driven cavity problem, and then these are the epochs that you spend on the minimization. Uh, and then we have the original Odile, which is operating with one grid. And now when we start to do uh, multiple grids, uh, we start to get better and better. So it's, a, it's an interesting framework to do inverse problems, in, in my opinion. Any questions? You can do also um yeah you can also do automatic differentiation um with it so so this is coming up uh, this one which was the first paper of uh, two years that we tried to get it published anyway uh any questions uh, last part do i have time 10 minutes okay. I'll, I'll tell you the idea uh because i think you've seen me talking about this uh reinforcement learning so I, i'd like to show you the the video i like by reinforcement learning and um, so that you know about Pavlov's dog and so on. Um, uh, there is also what is learning. Learning in psychology is behavioral changes due to experience. Uh, reinforcement learning is that you have a particular pattern that you reinforce. That's 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 the thing. Um, so so you you try to use a stimulus, but the particular action pattern is rewarded. And and so this work actually uh, it has a lot of history in psychology and. The, the, some of the first works actually were done at Harvard by a guy called Burus Skinner. Do people know Burus Skinner? Uh, no? Some, have you seen the video with the pigeons? You have seen the video with the pigeons. I will show you the video with the pigeons. So here's Burus Skinner. The two uh, pigeons are at either end of a small ping pong table. One pigeon uh, pecks the ball as it comes toward him and knocks it toward the other pigeon. Other pigeon pecks so the ball back safe, across the actually, table. If it goes past now, one pigeon, the other pigeon store, can eat, and if it goes the other way, the other pigeon opens, eats. So if there's a real, it's eats, a real game, the uh, pigeon the other guy uh, is, score, is reinforced the for a cross-court shot. Is that is what so he, he trains the, the pigeons opponent. to play ping pong, and pigeons are clever animals. So this research was financed by DARPA at the time. Can you imagine for what? You know the story? Uh, so anybody wild imagination <laughs> what can you use what can you do the pigeons this is about the 50s now cold war so the pigeons could be what 
exactly. They could be missile pilots. So there's this beautiful article you can read. Uh, he was, the idea is you train the pigeons, and when they see a particular image, then they peck and, and then a button, and then the, the missile goes down. <laughs> this is Boris Skinner. Uh, it was a brilliant idea, in my opinion, <laughs> as a kid. I think that it was never implemented because you would be depending on the condition of a pigeon whether a missile comes down on you. But it was, he, he did this, and actually the first theory on, on reinforcement learning, it's embarrassing, I don't remember really the name, is that PhD thesis in applied math at Harvard, which is based on the uh, work of, it's a pioneer in reinforcement learning. I forget. <laughs> I, I, it's, a, yeah. So what is reinforcement learning? The reinforcement learning is, is a semi-supervised learning. You don't know the full information, but you have some, what is interesting is you can define a cost function with the quantity of interest that you like. It also, um, you can decide what are the states, what are the actions. So it's a very flexible framework, but because it's a flexible framework, it's also problematic because you can take, you can pick the wrong states and the wrong actions and, and you will never get anything to work. Uh, now, we're talking about something called the policy. Um, the idea of the policy is that you have weights. And then what you do is you're basically maximizing uh, a long-term reward through um, uh, an expectation on a probability distribution. Here, the probability distribution is a Gaussian probability distribution. Same theme um, as before. We're learning the mean and a covariance of a probability uh, distribution. We have not changed. We're just doing this again and again in different ways. Now, the neural net is dumping out the mean and a covariance of probability distribution. You sample this probability distribution, and then by changing the weights of the neural network, you are changing the actions that you uh, so, so this is this is another way to play with probability uh, uh, distributions. So um, early works, uh, I, a lot of people maybe forget to, 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 to say how it, it was painful to, to even publish these things. Again, that's why I'm saying it. But here we were using wavelet adaptive grids and reinforcement learning. I was trying to put fish to school together. You put these fish, you give them the same amplitude, they will diverge. Uh, you put them out of phase, they will do different things. It was very difficult to solve this as an optimization problem. So here's some fish, uh, you put them in this diamond formation and you let them swim. There's this famous paper by Weiss that says if people, if, if fish swim like that, then uh, you will get schooling. Well, the, the, the Weiss paper is wrong because you have nailed the fish in their place. As soon as the fish start to uh, propel themselves, there's slow structure interaction. So they will move around. Uh, and, and so this classical picture of vice, for those of you who know it, is wrong. Uh, and, and, and we struggled to, for some time. But then we came up with the idea of using reinforcement learning. Uh, we came up with uh, this idea of dipoles. And then the dipoles, um, they're having hydrodynamic interactions, very strong interactions. But then we say, OK, if you want to be in the school, you have to train each one of these dipoles to move in such a way to follow a point. In a lattice, um, we were uh, initializing things like that. Um, they were failing. Um, uh, uh, then we initialize in square formation. There's a lot of papers that say, if you want to initialize dipoles in this shape or in that shape, you, you, you get schooling. I, I completely disagree. If you run it for a very short time, yes, they stay like that. But if you run it for a long time, they go away. So here is our, 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 I'm proud about this because the first time that someone did reinforcement learning and strong hydrodynamic interactions. Uh, so this is training these dipoles to, to go in a swarm. Um, this is about seven, eight years ago. Uh, and with the resources we had back then, uh, eventually we got them to stay in, in, in a school. Uh, we played with different configurations. You see here now they have learned and, and they're staying there. And, and then uh, we did, um, do I have this? slide or I lost this slide again. Ah, then um, we did other things and, and the other things we did are this. Um, uh, we could put a fish to, to swim in a circle. Uh, this is Vortisti, which actually verified some ancient Greek artifacts like this one. Uh, and, and also you can see my kids being young and doing exactly the same thing without me bullying them. Uh, <laughs> it was self-organization. <laughs> now, interesting thing about reinforcement learning it has a, it's a very beautiful and a very flexible uh, framework. And the thing is that you play many, many, many uh, games. Uh, um, and, and then the idea is uh, when you're coming over here and, and can you use all these games that you have played? 
there's different uh, ways that, that you can go about that. There's a, a wonderful colleague of Peter, Jürgen Spielhuber, who knows all the tricks of this game. Um, and, and, and we have actually been playing with that. And, and actually what we find is that, in, in a sense, what you do in reinforcement learning, reinforcement learning is equivalent to um, important something. In a sense that you are having a probability distribution from which you want to sample, and instead of that probability distribution, you look at the distribution in the past and you sample from that. Right? And what people have been doing in computer science, I think they have not been aware of some of the criteria we use in physics to compare probability distributions. So, so usually what they do is they do this trust region. If the ratio of the two probabilities, the one from the past that you have and the current one, is very large or very small, then they will not accept it. We added a second thing, which is to compare the chi L divergence between the current probability distribution that we have formulated and the past. We came something called remember and forget experience replay, and 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 we compare with some very famous people like Michael Jordan, Peter Abil. They have these humanoid uh, benchmarks. Um, this is our work. This is this is their work. You can clearly see our our work is much better, but <laughs> but you can actually see it quantitatively. And quantitatively, you see it in two ways. This is the reward that our method gets because you how much faster uh, you, can, you can walk. Uh, we compete in every Mujoko task. And another thing, if you take an off-the-self reinforcement learning algorithm, you try to do fluid mechanics, it doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, and, and the other thing to see that why our algorithm is good, if you, if you compete, if you compare the Kulbach, if you look at the Kulbach Leibler divergence between the experiences and the online, you find that in our case, we go down, which is actually how we have built the algorithm, but for them, they stay in some very high uh, divergence. So, so they're using, they're doing important something with a probability distribution that's not very similar to the one that they have. So this refer, I, I'm, I'm quite proud about it. Uh, uh, also, uh, Guido Novati should be uh, also, uh, and, and um, and, and that's how we have done a lot of different simulations. I, I will show you um, some simulations we have been doing where we are training fish to, um, to follow each other. So here, uh, for those of you who have not seen it, we have taught this fish. This fish has certain observations about the fish in front, and then it learns to swim right behind the other fish. And then uh, when we did that, okay, we said, okay, that's interesting. But then we looked at the power of deformation of this fish. And we found that the power of deformation of the one uh, behind is less than the power of deformation than the one uh, in front. Uh, even though we didn't ask for that, uh, but uh, apparently it is efficient to swim in the wake. Um, by swimming right behind the other fish, you get 11%. Um, and now um, I, I wanna show you actually just for fun. Um, now we wanna maximize efficiency. So. There is a horrible delay. So now we are uh, maximizing. Oh, yeah. I see a different screen than what you see. So I should comment on that. OK, so, so now actually we are having a new goal was maximizing efficiency. And actually was, we were very surprised that this guy went down like a missile into the wake of, 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 the, other, um, of the other fish. And then. Uh, it, It senses um, the um, distance uh, from this fish. It senses its own motion, its proprioception, a very important uh, thing, and the angle of its orientation and its efficiency. And it actually slowly found out that if it starts to tilt towards the other fish, the efficiency starts to go up because the long range signature of the orcasis. And then once it learned that, it went down like a thing into the world. So, and, and all this is automatic. I, I do not know how to do this. That's a, to the credit of learning that, that, that I discovered. Did you post for that? You wrote the policy of the presentation? No, no. I start from a new reward, but I don't do transfer learning. I can comment on transfer learning. I don't, I can, you, know, you have to take my words. If I, uh, this is Reynolds number of about, if I take, if I increase the Reynolds number to 3,000, it works. 3,500, barely. The Reynolds number 5,000 doesn't work. Transfer them for this. I have to retrain. But I can retrain faster by starting with the original. Uh, 
Um, but the blind transfer learning doesn't doesn't work. Um, now we just to go fast. To, I want to go to the last thing. We can do also this thing with three dimensions. So these are really interesting simulations. The vortex dynamics are beautiful. I, I would not have been able to, to, to discover all these things without reinforcement learning. And, and we are doing a heroic simulation that we're trying to, to do something very big. This is 300 fish um, resolved with adaptive mesh refinement. Uh, there's no learning, but they're interacting with each other. They're using some big supercomputers. Uh, and, and we want to see what is the, what, what are the collective hydrodynamics or something like that. It's just a, a, a pie in the sky type of simulation. Um, we, we also train things in, in other domains. So this is going back to blood. This is an artificial bacterial flagella. I was telling you last night in, in dinner. And if you let this guy uh, go, usually the red blood cells will push it out. But if you use reinforcement learning to control it, you can keep it in the center and then you can do targeting in this case. And, and the last idea, which I'll tell you the idea and finish with it, is I said, um, learning is good for statistics, not necessarily for exactness. So here is a beautiful place where learning reinforcement learning can be interesting. And this is the place where you are doing closures. Okay, so you all know what closures are. So the idea is, can I create closures for uh, using the mean value quantities? And for me, this looks like a control problem. So I thought, let's use reinforcement learning to do this closure. Um, and and uh, so I, I, again, now that my students came back and, and then they said this is impossible because the states are too many. Uh, and the states are too many because you have a grid and you have a 32 cube grid. And, and that gives you, what, about 27, 30,000 states and 30,000 actions you have to act on where. So I have not done many things in my life, but this one I did. I thought, you know, the grid points now can have a double life. And the double life is the same way that you come up with a function and you say how this thing is going to change according to its neighbors. Uh, you can get it from numerics, Taylor series and what forth, but you can also get it through reinforcement learning. And, and you do that by looking at the grid points, not only as grid points that you do the shootizations, but looking at the grid points as agents that they can now learn. And now these agents, they can learn locally. Uh, uh, you can play with that. You can have them have different policies. Uh, you can do all sorts of great things. And that actually breaks the complexity of the, of the learning task. Um, and then you start to have uh, fun. Um, uh, so, so again, um, this was the paper which I think we, we showed this. We did it in, we didn't do it in 1D. We did it in homogeneous turbulence. Uh, uh, it took us some time to find out what were the right states. I have up there. Uh, we had to eventually incorporate um, the eigenvalues of the gradient tensor and the Laplacian tensor as states. Otherwise, this thing would not understand that it is a homogeneous <laughs> turbulent flow. We were learning the uh, coefficient over here of the Smagorinsky model, and our reward was given by matching DNS results. If someone could have given us experiments, we could have done it also uh, with experiments. Uh, very quickly, um, the results. Um, the results are this is, um, this is, we trained in different Reynolds numbers. This is the training set. And as you can see, there is extrapolation to higher Reynolds numbers over there. Uh, the black line is the DNS. And look at, um, at the blue line. So the blue line is what this uh, multi agent reinforcement learning came up. Uh, and, and then there is one more line that is interesting. And that is if you train in only one Reynolds number, the 111. Can you extrapolate and, and downpolate, if you like? And actually, it was interesting that it was doing better for higher Reynolds numbers than for lower Reynolds numbers. We don't know what. And another thing is, if I um, if I change my policy and we decide to play uh, to play with the policy that's based on the Germano identity, it didn't work. We got not very good results. The red line is the Germano identity uh, policy that we came up. So, so the policy you use the state the actions are a big thing. Um, uh, with Jane, uh, we did it also for well turbulence, and and the key thing again uh, was to incorporate some kind of an estimate of the law of the wall into the states. For those of you who know the law of the wall, uh, you recognize what are my states. Is you you actually take the wall model, and if someone if you want to use the wall model, someone should give you the kappa and the b. Uh, 
uh, nobody gives us, we don't ask for the kappa and the b. It took us some time to tell to the reviewers, we don't need the kappa and the b, but if you take the derivative of this, you get an expression for the kappa, and then if you have the kappa, you can get an expression for the b. And that's actually what we uh, really do. And, and, and now by, by doing that, we got some really interesting results. Um, uh, with Jane, uh, we trained up to this. Um, um, this is if you use a state, uh, if you use a state, the velocity field, then this thing was not able to generalize. But here we train up to Arital 10 to the 4. This is a blow up of the error up there. You see that you go up to 10 to the 6 and you are staying down to 4%. And, and to me, this is a really nice result. And then one more thing is um, we took now transfer learning for you. We learned in the channel. And we applied it to um, uh, a turbulent boundary layer. Okay, it's not very different, but still. And, and, and this it seems to be amazing. Uh -huh. uh, so I think it's a powerful way. Uh, I'd like to close by, by saying some thoughts on machine learning. I think all these things about neural nets and, and so on, and open encoders, is about association. Um, and this is from a book by Julia Pearl, The Book of Life. So this idea that you associate things um, is, is where machine learning, I think, is at the moment. There is the idea of interventions, as, as Judea calls it, that you are playing with it all. And I really like this idea because you intervene, you do something, and then you see what happens. And, and, and reinforcement learning belongs in this category because you actively do something to the flow and you learn at the same time. So I think that's where we are. We go from here to there. And according to Judea, and he argues beautifully in his book, I recommend this book, um, he thinks that machine learning will never go there, where humans are. It's about counterfactuals, imagination, retrospection, and understanding. Uh, and that's actually the things that perhaps we should be uh, teaching our people, uh, not necessarily only the things uh, down there. That's all for me. Uh, thank you. And thank you for going extra time for me.